uh, Christendom. And um, uh, there's going to be people that are really, really inspirational. Then there's going to be other people where, uh, where it's going to bring some explanation for why we are at and how we are at, where we are, we are at um, within, within Christendom. Um, and then when we get a little further along, it's going to start to get kind of tricky. <laughs> um, actually, believe it or not, this is our 15th week of studying interrupters, you know. <laughs> and um, it's, it's going to get a little tricky as we start to get into, as I think probably... Uh, might not be until September when we start to get into just the last hundred years and some of these men and women that God used to bring heaven to earth because there's going to be people that you love, okay, and, and, and yet you don't love. You're going to be like, man, I, oh, wow, that's incredible, but I don't think I like them. You know what I'm saying? And, and it's going to get a little bit, it's going to get a little bit tricky. Now, the reason why I say that is because tonight it gets a little bit tricky with this interrupter that we are going to be um, uh, studying. Uh, and because what we're going to be looking at tonight is um, uh, one of the early uh, theologians that, that really began to shape um, Christendom in a way that, that, that still really impacts our faith um, to this day. In fact, um, St. Augustine... Okay, was a, a great, 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 well-known, famous, still highly, highly respected, not just within um, Christendom, but even outside, even in major philosophical circles. This guy is highly, highly, highly respected for his contribution um, to just thought and the understanding of humanity and um, in society. And, um, and yet, to a certain degree, some of his ideas and some of his, his thoughts and concepts um, affect our understanding of God and even our understanding of ourselves in a negative way, and even what I might consider to be an unbiblical way, okay, or even more of like a, a way that could be true leading up to Christ. And so tonight's going to be interesting because we're going to actually look at a, uh, an interrupter that lived around 354 to 430. So we're still really early on. Um, last, last time when we were together, we studied even St. Patrick. And so we are still really early on, um, just a couple hundred years post the resurrection of Christ, okay? Um, but after tonight, as we start moving forward, we're going to start advancing quickly um, uh, through church and looking at some wild supernatural. I mean, we're going to be looking at levitation miracles. We're going to be looking at, um, yeah, at, at just some really wild, you're like, levitate? Yeah, yeah, like, like the saints that as they would worship, they would be lifted off, the, off of the ground, right? And, um, I mean, we even hear stories of the Azusa Street Revival um, uh, where the saints would be lifted up off, off, the, off of the ground. They'd hold on to their chairs. Um, it was kind of like pre-rap, it was like rapture practice, <laughs> you know. So anyways, we're, we're going to have some fun. We're going to be looking at some wild, at some wild um, uh, stuff. But I have an idea. Uh, before we dive into all of that, um, actually, let me give you a quick update. Um, so last week we were in Charlotte, um, and that was a big deal because we were invited uh, to be with uh, Sid Roth and to be on his show. Um, it's, it's supernatural, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I got to speak with our 9 and 11 a.m. about it this morning. Um, but, you know... Uh, we, we were expecting to have a good time, and what we actually found was a lot of favor and relationship and opportunity. And so um, uh, the morning of the big shoot, they said, Sid wants to see you in his makeup room. And so, uh, believe it or not, the guy wears makeup. So anyways, we, went in there, and they're getting them, all, getting them all done up, you know. And he said, um, was your dad Daryl Stott? And I was like, Yeah. And he says, I think very highly of your dad. Anyways, this was really cool. I had no idea that Sid Roth even knew who my dad was. And he thought, you know, do you walk in the same glory anointing that your father walked? And this is interesting. Today on Father's Day, one of our elders, the Caspers, um, who have been here 54 years, they found a letter from the, de the denomination that my dad was in in the 90s uh, sharing their concerns for the revival of 1994 and uh and and i got this letter saying we are concerned about the following you, you know what i'm saying and, I, and and that was so epic to get this letter of of friendly we're watching you <laughs> on father's day because i was reminded of of even my father my dad who pioneered something in in the glory Right, who endured uh, crazy persecution so that we can run with the things of God in our generation with little to no resistance, you know? 
So anyways, that, that was a trip, you know, Sid knows who my, and we, were, and we were filming a commercial, and Sid says this, my next guest is Darren Stott. His father was a legend. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe, I was like, dad, I know you're in on this, you know. My dad passed in 2016, and I, and I just know that he was, I know the great cloud of witnesses was just a, a lot closer than any of us wanted to even imagine at, at that moment, okay. I know he was just up there, hoo, 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 good times. So I had, we were having lunch together, it was before the, the show, I was sitting across the table, and Sid had shared with, with me earlier that when he was young, he met Catherine Coleman. And Catherine had told him it was her desire to host the glory with excellence through media. And she laid hands on him that he would also receive that anointing. So at lunch, I said to Sid, Sid, would you pray for me that I would receive that anointing to host the glory with excellence through media? And he said, yes, I'll pray for you, but only if you agree to do a show for me. Uh, I said, he said, on my network... For zero cents, no cost. And so I, so I was thinking, all right, so you'll pray for me that I will receive the anointing of Catherine Coleman that you received to host the glory with excellence through media if I will agree to do a show for you on your network at no cost. Let me, uh, hold on. Let me pray about that. Yeah, I know some of you are thinking, Pastor Darren, did you pray about that? I'll be honest with you, not even for a second. I was like, my hands, okay, let's go, ding, ding. He grabbed my hand. He began to pray for an impartation of that anointing. I was just like, ah. I don't, th honestly, I don't think I heard a word that he prayed. I wish I would have recorded it. Because I was sitting there and all I heard was ringing. Like, ah. And I was just like, oh, my gosh. Uh, you know, I can't believe this is happening. Ah. Of course, on the outside, I was Cool, calm, collected, professional, had a lot of class, you know, but inside I was just like, ah! <laughs> you know, anyways, yeah, so that was super, that was super fun. Um, they've already followed up. We've got a conversation tomorrow. We're going to be, ch we're going to be chatting about show concepts and isn't that wild? Isn't that cool? <laughs> well, we better pray. Jesus help. <laughs> we need a lot of help. We need you. Uh, I just thank you, Lord, for everybody that's here tonight. I just thank you for every daddy, every father that's here tonight. I, I, I hope that they've all had amazing days. I, I hope that they've all heard from their children. Um, uh, but if they haven't, if this has been a difficult day, or uh, for those that haven't been able to have children, that kind of thing, I just ask that your grace would just be so wonderful tonight. I pray that every man in this place would just get a wonderful kiss from their Heavenly Father. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for just um, your, your kindness and your, your generosity. You're, you're so cool. Uh, Father, I even pray for uh, for people here that 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 didn't have good good dads that had that had um, uh, maybe not nice fathers, maybe abusive fathers. And again, I pray that that you would come as a kind father tonight. Um, Holy Spirit, we pray that you'd be here and that you'd reveal Jesus and you'd reveal the righteousness of Christ and you'd reveal the fullness of who you are and what was accomplished on the cross. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for giving of your life and for demonstrating such remarkable love for us. Jesus, our city needs you. Jesus, our church needs you. Jesus, our families need you. Jesus, we need you. And we need the understanding of all truth. We don't want to settle for anything less than your very best. Everything that has been taught to us that is theologically, theologically correct but is not of Christ. We ask that Holy Spirit would give us discernment to lay those things on the altar tonight. Because at the end of the day, we know that Jesus Christ is perfect theology. In Jesus, we want you. Amen and amen and amen. See this th word with me, theology. Yeah, in our revival kind of camp, in our kind of charismatic kind of camp, you don't necessarily hear this word a lot. In fact, um, I know pastors that use the word theology just because they know that their churches don't know what it means. I, I always crack up. I got, I got a buddy, he's like, and now with our theology, and I'm like, dude, that doesn't even make, that doesn't even make sense. But basically, <laughs> here's what it means, okay. And let me just say this. You don't have to go to Bible school to have theology, okay. 
every single person here has a theology. Even if you don't know what the word means, trust me, you have a theology. Even if you don't even believe in the existence of God, you have a theology. Theology is very simple. It just means your understanding of theos. <laughs> your understanding of, of your, the way that you conceive and perceive of the divinity of God. Your understanding of who God is, his character and his nature, is your theology. So if you're here today and you're like, well, I'm not a Christian, but I do believe in a God. And I know I haven't been living for this God. So this God is probably really angry with me. And if I were to die right now, this God would probably... Um, his face probably be really red and his cheeks probably really puffy. And his nose would probably be just like r even redder than his cheeks. And he would probably just, just damn me to hell and not even think anything. Of, like, like. So your understanding of God is that he's, you know, very angry and, and vindictive. And, 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 you know, and, um, or, or maybe you're just like, I, you know, I just believe that God is love and love is God. So your understanding of God is that there's not even a personhood to it. That God is just basically this, this, this force, this kind of this wind like. So whether you're in the new age or whatever else, everybody has some sort of uh, viewpoint of God and what God is. Now, just because you have a theology doesn't mean you have correct theology. What determines if we have correct theology? The word of God. Someone say Amen. <laughs> I mean, we do believe that, right? Amen just means we're in agreement. So, cheers. All right, good. <laughs> the Word of God determines if our theology is accurate. So this is why the Bible is kind of a big deal. This is why it's, it's kind of important that we read the Bible for ourselves. Not just to have Pastor Darren read it to you. It's really important that, that we read the Bible and we don't do it alone. That we read the Bible with Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, thank you that you're with me. I pray that you would illuminate these pages. I pray that the words would be active and alive. I pray that they would come into me. And I pray that they would reveal who you are and who I am in you. Now let's read the word. So you read the word with Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, Holy Spirit begins to do so. Now, a lot of people think that, that it is our role to study God's word. And that's not actually true. It's the, it's the job of the active and alive word of God to study us. We don't study the Word of God. The Word of God studies us. Okay? And as we begin to read, all of a sudden we go, oh my goodness, I'm not, hey, okay, there, here's a wonderful, you know, here's a wonderful opportunity to grow. Here's a wonderful opportunity to level up. <laughs> How do you level up in the kingdom? You repent. Repent just means level up, change, change your thinking. You, you all of a sudden you get a new thought and you realize, wow, I am this in Christ. And all of a sudden it raises the bar, right? And, 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 and you level up. And so this is the wonderful thing about the Word of God. However, when it comes to theology, nobody here has perfect theology. And that's where I love what Bill, Bill Johnson says. He says, Jesus Christ is perfect theology. But if we're honest, most of us, our theology goes too far in some areas and then not far enough in others. Yeah. And, um, and so here's what that means. It means that we see in part, okay? And you know what? Thank God for people like St. Augustine. You know, thank God for these theologians that have really carved out realms for us and, and really, really went, went, went to some places. I mean, uh, it, it, it's, it's awesome. Um, but we're going to look at the contribution of St. Augustine um, to, uh, to our faith. So first of all, again, we're talking early on um, within early Christendom, A.D. 354 to 430. Um, this guy was a theologian, a philosopher. He lived in northern Africa. He was the bishop of Hippo, okay, which is in north a Africa, up where, uh, uh, I'm going to, how do you say it? Tangania? Tangania. Yeah, up, up, up towards the, 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 the top part of Africa. His writings developed Western philosophy and Western Christianity significantly. He's considered by many to be one of the most important church fathers. 
And uh, many of his works, okay, he's got many important works, but the three that he's most known for are the city of God, on Christian doctrines, and confessions. In fact, he is considered to be the ancestor of, Prot- of Protestant. <laughs> We're going to have fun tonight. The ancestor of Protestantism. <laughs> All right, good time. I'm making up words. Strategy. Okay, awesome. Which is interesting because he was a Catholic. Okay? And so you see this, um, uh, this Catholicism thing. Many years later, we'd see the Great Reformation. And we see that the writings of St. Augustine would bring theology and word choice to what were considered to be the rebels that broke off from the early church to take the theology of St. Augustine to begin carving out a contrasting form of Christianity, something that would contrast greatly from the Roman Catholic Church. Now, Augustine was uh, a philosopher, lived in the 4th and 5th century. Um, uh, He lived on the fringes of what was a rapidly declining Roman Empire. He served as a bishop, as a pastor of a local church for 35 years. He was incredibly popular and considered inspirational to his largely educated and poor congregation. Um, In the last days... Uh, of his ministry, um, there was a Germanic tribe known as the Vandals, and they actually went into this region in, uh, 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 up here in northern Africa. They burned uh, the city of Hippo to the ground. They killed countless people. They kidnapped all the young women in, in the town, and they, and they took them uh, to be trafficked. Um, but after demolishing all of the houses, all of the businesses, leveling this region, kidnapping uh, the young women, they actually left um, uh, uh, St. Augustine's um, church as well as his library. It was left completely untouched because of respect for what he had established there in that region. Isn't that incredible? That... (laughs) Here you have these pirates, and they are evil, and yet they respect what this pastor had done in his community, and they leave his church and his library alone. Isn't that phenomenal? That's wild. So, St. Augustine carved out a philosophical philosophical legacy uh, to Christians and non-Christians alike because of his criticism of Rome. Uh, He looked at Rome, he looked at its values, its outlook, and the interesting thing was Rome had a lot of similarities with the United States of America. So to this day, St. Augustine is studied and celebrated by Christians and non-Christians alike because of the parallels. When they read St. Augustine, they're like, oh my goodness, this is just as relevant for us here in America as it was for Rome. Now, when it comes to Roman thought, the Romans had, if we were to take the, the, the big Roman kind of ideas within its thinkers, they had two philosophical ideals that they thought was possible. The first thing is that they believed in earthly happiness here and now. And they also believed that they could adjust social order. They believed it to a certain degree with the right government, with the right order, with the right institutions, with the right values, with the right criminal justice uh, uh, ideals, that they could create utopia, they could create peace on earth through government. Now, when it came to earthly happiness, the Romans were known for having an incredibly optimistic outlook. Um, They accomplished much as a people and as a society, and they celebrated their engineering. Uh, You can go to Rome to this day and see just such intricate, such amazing architecture and engineering and even wild technology. Um, 
It's possible, and it's, it's been said recently, that Rome was far more advanced than what we even know now. That they had technology that, that because, it, it, it's, it, because of the years that we don't even know about, but they, they see these different indications that say that Rome was probably even far more advanced than what, we, than, what, than what we've ever known. And we see that Rome knew this, they celebrated this, and they believed it was just going to get better. They believe that their tech was just going to get better and better and better. I imagine that they were even talking about, you know, algorithms and AI and, and, and you know, the Romans like, pretty soon we'll have a robot that does that, right? <laughs> so they were very, very optimistic about their future. And their faith was ultimately in themselves. Their faith was in their technology. Their, their, their faith was in this, this place where we humans are stepping into such incredible self-mastery. It was the celebration of human ingenuity and their ability to control and manipulate na nature and to plot their own happiness and satisfaction. Writers like Cicero and, and, and Pl uh, Pl Plutarch okay, had a, a great degree of pride, ambition, and confidence in the Roman future. And when you read a lot of these early Roman writers and you read about, about the trajectory that they thought they were on, it sounds very, very similar to a lot of American futurists. If you read various tech magazines, if you read about the forecast for where we are going as a country, there is this understanding that, man, we humans are kicking butt. We are incredible. We should be very proud of ourselves. That, that was our, our, our service this morning at our 9 and 11. How do we respond to Pride Month? And we, we learned that pride is not just an ideal of the GL, GLBTQ plus 98 um, thing, okay, that pride is a default of the fallen human heart, yep, and that pride is grievous to the Lord. He says that, 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 that he opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So we see in this Roman uh, society uh, 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 great, great, great pride, great, great, great celebration and what they were going to uh, accomplish. Um, in their eyes, uh, 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 human beings um, uh, were something that would just continue to be in process and process, but humans were on this track to ultimately being perfected through our um, commitment to better ourselves. In fact, the Romans had keen practitioners of what we would call today those who would be in the self-help movement. A lot of the Roman literature was training their audiences to greater success and effectiveness. Um, the, be the next big area of, of Roman discipline and thought was this area of, of not just earthly happiness is possible, but the next big area was the area of that the social order of the city could be adjusted little by little until it's perfected. And we have a heaven on earth society because of our human disciplines and because of our justice system. Okay, And so for long periods of time, the Romans trusted their society was marked by justice. That people would have ambition and, and intelligence, that those that had the drive in Roman society, they could make it to the top. Um, the Roman army was trusted to be uh, 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 just, fair, and the idea was this, that within the Roman society, there was the capacity to make money. And your capacity to make money was held to reflect both practical, a practical ability as well as a degree of inner virtue. Therefore, if you had money, you should show it off. If you've got, if you've got it, flaunt it. Because if you've got wealth, you are actually showing that you are a person of great virtue and nobility. So if you are a virtuous person, if you are a good person, okay, that could be seen in what you had. So in Roman society, fame was a big deal. 
Money was a big deal. It was all about what you were driving. It was all about what you were wearing. Okay. I have no idea what the Roman equivalent of Instagram was. But you can bet those fools were taking selfies all day long. Okay. And so in Roman culture, it was all about fame, money, sex, and power. The more of those things that you had operation within your life, you were a... The kind of human being that Rome wanted. You were the kind of human being that Rome celebrated. And if they would celebrate these, these ones, these celebrities, these citizen celebrities, if we celebrate that behavior, we will get more of it. If we punish and crucify the opposite behavior, we will get less of it. Now, St. Augustine, he was furious with these ideals. <laughs> He disagreed hugely <laughs> with both of these assumptions that he created what would be known as his masterpiece, the city of God. Now, in the city of God, he dissected each of these two points. And, and he said that the, the human life could be perfected and societies were just, that, uh, that these Two things were impossible. That full happiness of the human on this earth was impossible. And that radical social order and justice was also not possible. Why? Because of sin. St. Augustine was the very first theologian that began to teach this principle or this value known as original sin. How many of you ever heard of original sin? Okay, this concept came from St. Augustine. Okay, and he proposed that all humans were crooked, depraved, because all of us are unwitting heirs to the sins of Adam. That's probably not a new thought, right? If you've been Christian for any amount of time, um, you've heard this before. Yep, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But this is what St. Augustine would say. All have sinned and fallen short of, of, of the glory of God. Therefore, everyone is born a radical train wreck, depraved, fractured, and even if you get saved, you are still a radical train wreck, depraved, in need of a savior, right? Why? Because you are still living in the city of man. And until we arrive in the city of God, that's just the way it is. That's just the way it is, right? So, this, he said, our sinful nature gives rise to what Augustine called... Another big Greek word, libido dominandi, which means a desire to dominate. He declared, this is evident in the brutal, blinkered, merciless way that we treat others in the world and around us. He declared, we cannot properly love, for we are constantly undermined by our egoism and our pride. Our powers of reasoning and understanding are, are, are fragile in the most extreme. Lust haunts our days and nights. We fail to understand ourselves. We chase phantoms with a set of anxieties. Augustine concluded his assault by rebuking all philosophers with these words, have wished with amazing folly to be happy here on earth and to achieve bliss by their own efforts. So, what is St. Augustine saying? He's saying that happiness, bliss, paradise, and the city of man is a false assumption. Not even possible. That while you are here and now, wrapped in the fracturedness of your parents, that while you are positionally righteous because of Jesus, you will be practically shady and untrustworthy until you die. 
But don't worry, it's not just you, it's everybody. We are all shysty. And because of that, don't trust anybody and have a lot of accountability. Okay. <laughs> yeah, good times. Now, this sounds depressing, but it actually turned out to be a relief to a lot of people that hear this philosophy and this theology. Because, well, here's another quote. We are creatures fated to intuit virtue and love while never quite being able to secure them for ourselves. Our relationships, careers, and countries are necessarily not as we want them to be. It isn't anything specific we have done. The odds are simply stacked against us from the start. All these ideals that we have, when we look at the world, this is not the way it ought to be. Well, too bad, so sad. And listen, don't beat yourself up too much. It really, ultimately, at the end of the day, isn't our fault. You never asked to be born a human. But because you were born a human, all of these odds are stacked against you. This is what is known as Augustinian pessimism. And many people believe that this kind of thought and theology, it actually takes off some of the pressure that we might feel when we come to terms with the imperfect nature of humanity and everything that we do. So when you let me down, of course you let me down. You're a human, and that's what humans do. Humans let each other down. So-and-so sinned. Well, so-and-so shouldn't have sinned. So-and-so is a big-time minister that preaches against sin and always counts to three and demands that sinners run to the altar. But now we just found out that so-and-so who said run to the altar because of the sin was doing that same sin. Ah, that's so horrible. How dare that person? And then someone else is like, well, of course. Of course so-and-so sinned because so-and-so is a sinner and sinners sin. So if you're already let down by all of humanity, no human can ever let you down. And that is the relief given to you through Augustinian pessimism. You'll never be let down. Why? You were born let down. Everybody let you down. You let yourself down. So, hey, isn't that great? You will never, you will never get bitter. You'll never whatever. All humans suck. I suck. That's just the way it is. Okay? Good times. <laughs> How many of you have ever been to that church? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. Okay? I got my hand up. <laughs> I'll tell you my story in a second. Good times. Now, when it came to the Romans, they began, their theology was radically different. When, when, when Constantine was converted, there were theologians in his time, including um, uh, Isabus, uh, that proposed that earthly power was, and, and even fortune and fame, that these were instruments given by God to Christians so that the powerful people in Rome were not just privileged, but also blessed of the Lord. So in this time, um, the, in this, uh, this Constantinian conversion, and the beginning, the roots of what would become Roman Catholicism, we see that, that you know, um, you know, uh, uh, in the early church, you know, they didn't have any money. They didn't have any homes, okay. Uh, uh, Jesus was basically homeless. Um, he was always, you know, they, they were receiving offerings and, and, and they didn't have a lot of food. So he'd have, to, he'd have to multiply it, okay. So you got this kind of this, this thing that Jesus was modeling, okay. And then all of a sudden you go from that being kind of a picture of, of, of the glory of God and being seen in, through a very persecuted church to all of a sudden a church that says that, that you really can't be godly and be poor. You really can't be a part of this, this kingdom expansion, okay, uh, unless, and, and again, it was an integration of Roman philosophy, that you could tell someone's inner virtue or inner spirituality by what they were driving, what they were wearing, how they were talking, and their standing uh, within society, that God wants you to be powerful and privileged, and that God would reign over this. 
St. Augustine addressed this with this quote. What arrogant, boastful, and cruel claims. There never was, nor ever could be, justice in Rome, or indeed anywhere else on the earth, that God didn't give good people wealth and power, and nor did he necessarily condone uh, condemn those who lack them. So he was speaking up on behalf of people that lack these things and said that how can we make judgments on people based off of what they have and what they don't have. St. Augustine also distinguished between what he called the two cities. This was the city of men and the city of God. The latter, the city of God, this would come in the future. This was a heavenly paradise. This was Eden where the good would finally come and dominate, where power would be properly allied to justice and where virtue would reign. But men could never build such a city and should never believe themselves capable of doing so. They were condemned to dwell only in the city of men, which was a flawed society where money could never accurately track virtue. In Augustine's formulation, true justice has no existence save in that republic whose founder and ruler is Christ. Again, these things sound bleak and sound depressing that while we are on earth, it's just going to be shady, it's just going to be depraved, it's just going to be carnal. And yet, again, this really brought people into this realistic way to kind of help them process through humanity's stuff, and believe it or not, but this, these are major, major pillars in Christendom to this day. And this is the part of the night where I tell you my own story. <laughs> so I was raised in a charismatic kind of revival kind of place, okay, and here, and we had all kinds, you know, back in the day, you guys, we, Bill Johnson used to preach here on a regular basis. John and Carol Arnott would come through. Randy, Randy Clark, I think the record was we actually had a thousand people stacked in here like sardines one night. We actually, Nancy, you're probably here. We had uh, bleachers, big ghetto bleachers, and nobody cared. They weren't padded. They were pieces of wood on top of metal, and they went up these back walls on, on both sides of the room. And not just here, but also with, where the curtains pulled, bleachers in the back. Man, we were stacked in here. Man, we had, and I remember I was, I was a little, I was a little kid, and you know, not that little. I was probably a medium kid, coming into a bigger kid. That that whole weird age when you go from medium to bigger kid. Anyways, it, where you start to talk weird, oh, you know, voice cracking. That that age, okay. And I remember this point in time where, man, the wild heyday of revival, all of a sudden, came to an end just came to an end. And I remember this, this point where it was all of a sudden like these people that I had seen as heroes and this thing that I had seen as like the church in her perfection, even this thing that I had seen like my, this, uh, this, this idea of my parents and their perfection. I mean, in my, in, in my childhood perspective, like my parents were perfect. They had, absolutely had no issues. When all of a sudden I began to see the issues of the church, the issues in my parents, and then issues in these heroes that I began to look up to, all of a sudden there was this, I, th th this, this feeling. I don't know if I would have given words to this, but it was all of a sudden it was like, why is it I see bad and good people? Why is it that I'm seeing good and bad people? Why is it that some of the people that we call heroes are actually villains? And I began to get very disenfranchised with the church. And I believed a lie. And the lie that I believed was that Christians are hypocrites. And that I am done with the church. Yeah. And, man, I was, like, I, like, I remember getting into, into these, these debates with various people. And I would go off on these rants. Well, after Pastor Gail, and you guys have heard this story. And if you haven't, buy the CD. But um, <laughs> there's no CD. Just ask. So, yeah. Past, okay, so my past, okay, I didn't have, past, how do I do this? I'm stuck. 
Basically, Pastor Gail, this pastor, came back here. There's like 20 people left. She apologized to me for all these things that she didn't even do. I was like, I told everybody before I met with her, I ain't coming back to that church. I'm done with that church. <laughs> right? No, 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 no. I know what Gail wants to do. Gail wants me to do that. I'm not coming back. No, 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 no. But I'll meet with her because, you know, I respect her. Then how do you, how do you reject somebody that's apologizing to you? I mean, you, you can, but I, hadn't, I didn't have that figured out. I was like, so I said, I forgive you. I didn't even, you know, I didn't even think I meant it. But I had forgiven someone for the very first time in a long time. I hadn't forgiven anybody, right? So now my heart was open. And my heart hadn't been open for a long, long, long time. So God tricked me, gave me a dream, used the dream to put desire in me. And now I'm back at the church. I'm back at the place where I didn't want to be. Yeah, yay. Okay, good. So now I'm back here. And um, I'm saying yes to the Lord. I'm getting inner healed. It's taking a long time. I wish I could have just had my orphan spirit cast out. But orphan spirit is not a demon. It's a stronghold. It's a fortress of thought. You can't cast it out. It has to be massaged and worked and brought into truth. I had a bigger orphan spirit than any of y'all, Okay. So I'm in process. I'm saying yes to the Lord. As I'm saying yes to the Lord, he's beginning to order my steps. All of a sudden, Andrea's interested in me. She had never been interested in me before. That's a miracle. That's supernatural. I should have told that to Sid. The most supernatural thing in my life was that Andrea would be interested in me. <laughs> we start dating. Now, here's the thing. At this time, there's a, there's a church in Seattle that's starting to explode. This church was starting to just to blow up. And it was a big deal because it was downtown Seattle, and it was, it was full of men. It was full of dudes. And um, I heard about, my buddy gave me a CD, and I listened to it. And I had never heard somebody preach the Bible like this before. And it was Mark Driscoll. It was Mars Hill Church. Now, I know just saying that right off the bat, that there's going to be people in the room that are just like instantly triggered. <laughs> and then there's others of you that are like, yeah, sweet. And then there's others of you that have no idea. They have no idea what I'm talking about. Andrew and I would go here on Sunday mornings and we'd get a revival on. The Lion of Judah makes me want to roar, roar. With our, with, our, with our 50 foot praise flags. And then on Sunday night, we would go to a church where they had a grunge band that would lead worship. And, and, and there were no 50 foot praise flags, there were no tambourines. In fact, everybody worshiped the Lord like this. And I thought it was cool too. So, so Andrew and I would be there and we'd be getting our worship on. If there's a lot of glory, you'd look at somebody and just be like. You know what I'm saying? But night after night, Sunday nights, we, we'd go there and, and, and we'd hear the same thing. You are a sinner. You are worse than this. You are depraved. You need Jesus. Like every single week. And you know what? I liked that. Every week, Mark would, would, would talk about total depravity. How you're messing. He would even talk about babies. He would say that babies were sinners and that they, they're just little selfish, pooping, peeing babies. They're just this little blob of sin. And he's talking about babies. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> I've had four babies, and I know that there's not a little demon on a baby's shoulder saying, cry and get them to change your diaper. And then there's another little angel that says, no, don't, you know, like, no, babies do not have any sort of conscience. There's no, like, <laughs> babies are babies. I don't even know if they have brains. They just, like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> No, but babies are like these sinners. Like, and you know what? I ate it up. I believed it. And I... I feel like I needed it. I feel like it explained a lot. It, 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 and you know what? I felt like it was like, you know, it, without even realizing it, you know, it, uh, I was becoming a Baptocostal. I was becoming a revivalist by, by day and a Calvinist by night. I was like Batman, you know. <laughs> by day, I'm like, you know, like, I, you know, a billionaire. And by night, like, I, I'm all in black. And just like, you know, literally everybody, you had to wear black to get in the church. Like, it was just like, it was like, it was grunge church. You know what I'm saying? It was like, yeah. 
you know, here's the thing. I got so much out of that time. I had never heard the Bible my whole life taught through chapter by chapter, verse by verse. I love that. Guess what? I do that still to this day on Sunday mornings. I take people through books of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by I don't know anybody in the revival camp that does that. I don't know any other, and I'm not bragging, but I don't know any other revival center that's like, we're going to study the Bible every single week, and I'm not going to preach my peeves. Today we're going to talk about Biden again. Like, no, open your darn Bible and study the Bible, right? So, <laughs> uh, I'm not bragging, but what I'm saying is, I got a lot out of that time, but without realizing it, I had totally taken on the whole tulip thing. You say, what's tulip? Tulip is the, is the five points of Calvinism. It starts off with total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints. Calvinism was framed out by St. Augustine with this idea of that while we are in the city of man, don't be naive and contend for the city of God to exist on the city of man. These are two radically distinct, two different cities. Have realistic expectations and it will help you process through brokenness. It, I felt like it helped me. I was like, now I get it. Now I get why Todd Bentley did what he did. Because the dude's just a sinner and sinners sin. And now I get it why the church reacted to me and my family when we went through that time. I thought that they were sinless. No, they were sinners. And sinners sin. And then Pastor Gail had the audacity, had the boldness. Pastor Gail was so brave that she let me start teaching on a rotation on Sunday mornings. And every four weeks or five weeks, I would get to teach. It was passionate. But it was Horrible. I was the worst. I was the worst. I look back at my notes. They, my notes were the worst. But at least I was passionate. I, I can tell you this. It was bad, but it sure as heck wasn't boring. I would be up here dropping bombs and this, that, and the other. I was theologically a train wreck. My understanding of God was off. My understanding of who I was in Him was off. And here is a Baptocostal teaching Calvinism at Seattle Revival Center, screaming at everybody, telling them that they are sinners. <laughs> Meanwhile, Pastor Greg, I don't know if you know him, Amazing. He's always been such a father to me. I want to honor Pastor Greg Daly on Father's Day. He was, he was such a, he, he was there in the most significant points of my Christian advancement throughout my childhood. Still heavily involved in my life today. It, Pastor Greg would graciously come up to me and say, you know you're not a sinner. I'd say, yes I am. We're all sinners, saved by grace. And, and, and Greg would say, yep, you're, you're partially right. We are saved by grace. <laughs> but we are the righteousness of Christ. Darren, you are the righteousness of, of Christ. I would get so mad at him. I would get so mad at him. Why? Because if I believe that he who knew no sin became all of my sin, and that I am the righteousness of Christ, now it raises the bar. If I am 100% holy because of who Jesus is, if I choose to sin, what am I doing to the blood of Jesus? And what am I doing to his love? What am I doing to Jesus? What is the impact? If I am 100% pure and white, when I choose to disobey God. What, you see, if, if I can believe that I'm just a sinner, then what do sinners do? They sin. And when I make foolish choices, well, of course I'm going to make foolish choices. Because ultimately, we are all fools. We are all still in the city of men. But if we believe that Jesus changed everything, and Pastor Greg would be like, bro, you need to read the book of Romans. You need to read the book of Galatians. You need to see who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Jesus 
has changed everything. We are in union with him. We are in union with his righteousness. We are, we are participators of his nature. And he would just be going verse by verse. And, 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 and little by little, I began to, 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 to change um, my ideals and to begin to change um, a, 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 a lot of this stuff. And little by little, my standard on myself started going up. And my, but my standard on, on others did not go up. But my standard on my leaders went up with me. And it's weird. I've almost been like this. I'm just confessing. I, I'm also just kind of processing. Because in this study of St. Augustine, and as I began to see his word choice, there's word choice that he used that I still use to this day. And here I am thinking that I have purged myself of all Calvinism. Oh. But I am, that was gross, sorry. <laughs> Uncalled for. Anyway, I am learning that there are, that, that, that I still have some of these ideas that are still a part of my understanding. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I did. I would believe that I was the righteousness of Christ, but I wouldn't necessarily believe that for the body. Therefore, I had a safety net. When people would let me down, because I didn't have a high standard on people, they couldn't hurt me. This was my way to protect myself. I am the righteousness of Christ, while well, y'all are still practically shady. <laughs> However, my team and my staff, they are the righteousness of Christ, and I expect a lot from them. Yeah? Here's the truth. St. Augustine had some amazing ideas and carved out some amazing thoughts and some amazing, amazing stuff. But at the end of the day, perfect theology is not Calvinism. It's not Arminianism. We could get into that. We won't for the sake of time. Perfect theology is Jesus. And Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way. Father, let your kingdom come. The city of God, paradise, bliss, and may it be on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus said, you pray this way. And then all of a sudden Jesus dies, he resurrects, he ascends, he goes to heaven. And all of a sudden we begin to read these letters, these Pauline epistles. These letters from Paul to the churches. And what's Paul saying? Everything has changed. Everything has changed because of who you are. He would write to the Galatians. He'd say, who has duped you? Who has bewitched you? You guys think that you are where you are because of your own practices, because of your own goodness. You're, you're, you're behaving according to your own moral scale. I need to get you back on track. You are who you are because of your participation in union with Christ Jesus. Yeah, and we see this incredible message of God's grace and this incredible message of identity that Paul began to give to the church. And then we even see in the book of Revelation, John the Beloved caught up into the heavens. And the Lord begins to give John the Beloved these letters to the churches. And as he's writing these letters, John is saying, church, you need to raise the banner higher. You need to raise the standard higher. Why? Because this standard does not exist to shame you. This standard exists to invite you. The law was there to remind you of your need for a Savior. But the Savior is here to empower you to do what you could never do in and of yourself. Jesus changes everything. The kingdom of God. Jesus was always teaching not just a message of salvation. Jesus was always teaching a message of the gospel of the kingdom. It's this understanding. It's this reality that I really want to have in me. I want the good news of the gospel of the kingdom to set the banner. To set the possibilities. I don't want the total depravity of all of humanity and the fracturedness of the human state to set my idea of what is possible through the church. 
I don't want for our sinfulness to set our standard. I want for the righteousness of Christ Jesus to set our standard. I don't know what you're wrestling with tonight. I don't know what kind of sins are besetting you. I don't know what kind of emotional distress you might be in or what kind of temptation. You know, some of you all might be tempted to do some really weird, strange stuff. <laughs> but here's what I know. Because of Jesus, you don't have to sin. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, the power to overcome sin is possible in and through him, not in and through Darren, okay? But in and through Christ Jesus. The power to overcome sickness is possible in and through your Savior Christ Jesus. The, the ability to escape and to overcome even death itself is possible because of Jesus the Christ. It's so important and so imperative that we recognize that in Him we live, in Him we move, and in Him we have our being. So what would happen? St. Augustine would write a book called Confessions where he would confess, confess all of these embarrassing sins of his youth I don't think anybody should write a book where they expose all of the, the embarrassing sins of their youth. I think that should be between you and the Lord and maybe your parents if they were involved. And he was like, look at it. I went to, a, I went to a, a, a pastor's conference, this Calvinist pastor's conference, and I, I wore a black, a short black sleeve shirt with black pants. And um, when you, <laughs> you know, no joke, on this pastor's conference, you know, you would write your name, address, phone number, what your favorite beer was. It's just, you know, and on the, on the front page, pastors would confess their, their sins as part of the registration process. And as you're on this front page of this website, all these sins were going up on the, on the screen so you could read the, the sins of these pastors because they thought, hey, just, just honesty from, from pastors is... This, this will create kind of, you know, and um, let me just tell you this, sinful pastors is not inspiring to me. Like sinful church leaders, I mean, I love that there's a safe place for guys to, you know, expose their sin on a public website for everybody's, you know, it's like, get a counselor, you know, but um, all of their sins, it, why? Because they were finding some sort of form of, of freedom in it. But can I tell you, what our generation needs. We, we, need, we need men and women, not just leaders, who can, who can say, who, not that I right now am struggling with sin. We need mothers and fathers that say, I was struggling in that sin, but now I am free of that sin. And I wanna share with you my testimony of how I overcame the enemy with the blood of the lamb and the word of my listen you saying i'm such a sinner that doesn't inspire me i'm sorry <laughs> like i'm such a sinner hey that's awesome jesus is here we'll get you through it okay but like in 30 years from now if you're still struggling with that same sin bro you just need a straight up face to face with jesus okay yeah yeah, this is what I know. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not a gospel of cope and cold showers, okay? The gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of hope, freedom, reconciliation, and union. The gospel of Jesus Christ is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, okay? This is, <laughs> this is the gospel. This is the good news. It's either good news or it's not good news. Do you got good news? Or do you not have good news? You got saved 30 years ago. You probably shouldn't be an arsonist anymore. You should probably stop burning things down. If you are in Christ Jesus, He is transforming you. He is redeeming you. You should love people a little bit more now than you did this time last year. You should have a little bit more mercy for the church than you did this time last year. Man. <laughs> where do people that hate the church, where do they hang out? Facebook, it's crazy. It's like, 
it's like all the people that actually love the church are getting off of Facebook, you know, because I'm like, where are the people that actually love this thing? She's a bride. Like, don't you dare talk bad about my bride. You know, that'd be a good way, of, like, you know, to get some fillers, okay? But don't you dare <laughs> talk about the bride of Christ. Because you'll have to, you'll have to give an account to the groom. This bride has a bridegroom. Has a groom. You are part of the bride of Christ. And we're not perfect. But we're beautiful. We are in, we are in him. We have his re report card. And even on days when we fall short of his glory, his glory com compensates, his righteousness compensates. And we don't lose our standing. We don't, we don't lose our, our crown. We don't lose our footing. We don't have to start all the way, all the way over. That even when you run away from him, he's still there with his arms wide open with the possibility of always running back, running back to him. This is our God, and he is good. And it is possible for there to be a righteous people on the earth who reveal, it is possible for there to be righteous community. What if people said about Seattle Revival Center, when I was in that building, it felt like I was in Eden. That when I was with those, those people, it felt like was in heaven. When I was there, it felt like anything was possible. Man, I, I went and had coffee with Lisa. And when I was with Lisa, I felt like I was with Jesus. You know, when I was with Jessica, I felt like I felt like all the confusion was gone. It felt like that spirit couldn't operate in me. That what if it was possible for the things of this earth? to not define our frequency. That we didn't partner with chaos and confusion and jealousy and pride, but we partnered so with the Spirit of Christ Jesus that we could be, as John G. Lake so longed to see, a generation of Christ men, a generation of Christ women. Even as we were accused in the first century, the derogatory term for us was Christian. A Christ copycat. Oh, you just think that you're a clone of Christ. Yeah. I'm of his blood. You, you, you prick my finger, you will see his DNA. <laughs> just to clear me right now, he who knew no sin became all of my sin so that I could be the righteousness of Christ. Do you believe that tonight? Okay, you little supernaturalist interrupter, you. We need some interruptions in the body of Christ. We need some theological interrupt. We need an interruption of righteousness and righteous theology in the body of Christ. And I believe that's why you're here. He, bought, he brought the, the brightest and the best here tonight so we can learn together and process together, dive into the Word of God this week together, let it shape us and mold us, let our, our, our theology, our understanding of theos, our understanding of the character and nature of God and who we are in Him, that we would be shaped by His Word, by His Lord. Yeah? I think you're really awesome. I sure do. I think that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Yep, 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 yep. Uh-huh. As the prophets on Sesame Street from the other realm, yep, 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 uh-huh, uh-huh, you know. <laughs> All of his promises are yep, 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 uh-huh, uh-huh. Why don't you jump up to your feet? Yep, 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 yep. Uh huh, uh huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Even the power of, of blood sacrifice and satanic blood sacrifice being broken and shattered right now. Ha! I said right now. Ha! In Jesus' name. Whoa! Yeah! 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 yeah. Breakthrough, breakthrough. I see, I see the armies of breakthrough. I see the angelic armies of breakthrough marching in, marching into your circumstance, marching in to your family, marching in to your marriage. This is not the end. This is not the end. This is not the end. This is not, hey, this is not the end. Whoa, this is just the beginning. Just the beginning. Just the beginning. Just the beginning. Hey, yeah, pray with me. Yeah, 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 there it is, there it is, there it is. Woo! <laughs> hey! 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 Yeah, 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 Put your hand on your stomach. Just begin to engage the well. Oh, just, just declare the river of God that's flowing up, that's flowing up right now, up and out of you. Open up your gates. Open up your doors right now. That the King of glory, that the King of glory would just begin to come up and out of you. That the light of heaven would begin to come up and out of you. That the light of heaven would come out of your eyes. That the light of heaven would come out of your gaze. That the light of heaven would come out of your words. That the light of heaven would come out of your songs. That the light of heaven, yet the light of heaven, the very glory of the Lord, would begin to come up and out of you. Spring up a wells. Spring up a wells. Spring up a well. Bubble up, bubble up, bubble up, bubble up, bubble up. Bubble up, bubble up, bubble up. <laughs> bubble up, bubble up. Oh, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, 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 yeah
Sikilia Sola Maya, Ela Lara Silia Makishi Lama, O Kishilama Silia Maso Kishilama Se, He Kesela Masilia Maso, Kishilama Silia Maso Kilema. Oh, my soul rejoices in the Lord. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I had a dream. <laughs> and in this dream, I was here at SRC, but it was in the future, and I could hardly recognize the place. And the worship was, was, just, was just going off, and there were like musicians everywhere. And we had this huge stage that just came out, and there were just musicians all over the stage. And there was like so many chairs. There's chairs everywhere. There's chairs that there shouldn't have been chairs. And I just remember like, this is so awesome. And it was just so amazing. The, man, the glory of God was so intense. And so in the dream, um, I was hungry. And so I went, our church had like a restaurant. And, and so I, I went to this restaurant, and I had a personal assistant, so I knew it was in the future. <laughs> and, um, and me and my personal assistant, we order a burger. And so we're, we're doing what you should be doing during an awesome revival meeting. We're eating burgers. And as we're there, two guys come and they, they, they sit in the booth right across the table from us and I know that they're, they're theologians and so I'm sitting there and I said um, who are you guys? You guys you guys are theologians and they said yes and all of a sudden I just felt like something rise up within me just like this holy boldness and I said alright theologian let's see the power of God at work within you let's see what you can do in Christ Jesus, let's see your authority and they began to, to shake. They began just to just, just shake. And all of a sudden, their heads began to go down into their bodies. Their, he, their bodies were sucking their heads into their bodies. And then all of a sudden, so that their bodies no longer have a head. All of a sudden, their bodies literally began to boil their heads. So their heads were getting cooked inside their body. And then I felt bad for them. And I thought, oh, no, I need to rescue them. So I went to the one guy, and I reached down into his body, and I grabbed his head, and I, and I pulled his head out of his body. But when I did, all I did was I pulled, he shed his skin. And when I pulled it out, he had shed a snake skin. It, it was like, it looked, the, the face looked like the, fa the, the, the big head of a snake, and he had shed his skin. And I was like, ah. And I realized that these things that were coming disguised as the right understanding of who God was, that they were actually a demonic strategy to shut down that move of God. We're going to be studying a lot of saints together. We're going to be studying a lot of wild supernaturals. Can I tell you something that's interesting about St. Augustine? He was one of the few saints that never did anything supernatural. Bob Jones would say this, if you're gonna be a part of what God is doing, you gotta get out of here, and you need to get into here. He said the body of Christ, they need to learn to get their spirit over their heads, because we are shutting down what God wants to do between our ears. We gotta get this over this. So just put your hand on your stomach. I just pray for an activation of your spirit, man you would come fully alive and you might not understand what God is doing it might not make perfect sense you might not be able to explain it to your friends but you would know that it's real and that the spirit of God is inside of you 
that he's activating something inside you. And I pray that the fullness of who you are in Christ would so come alive and that your logic would not shut down who you are in him. That, you, that, that no critical thinking would keep you from the fullness of heaven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that no analytical processing would shut down the power of God in your life. I pray that his spirit would burn. And you might not say, I don't have the understanding of what God is doing, but his spirit is burning inside of me. And I will get understanding and I will search the scriptures and I will find it in the word. I know that if it's truth, it's of him and I will be able to find it in his word. But I'm not going to shut it down. If it's of Jesus, then I bless it. If it's of Jesus, then I bless it. And if it's not of Jesus, I don't fear it because I know who my Jesus is and I don't fear the demonic. So we celebrate the things of the kingdom and we celebrate those who are running with the fire of God in this time. And we're not jealous of those who are further ahead. We celebrate them. In fact, we say, spirit of jealousy, you are a demon. You are not of the Holy Spirit. You are not for me. I repent for partnering with the spirit of jealousy that's kept me from receiving the fullness of my inheritance. Spirit of jealousy, let me go. I bind you to all your other demonic buddies and I cast you out of me right now. I say up and out and to the pit right now. In Jesus' name, spirit of jealousy, spirit of comparison, let me go. Let me go. Let me go. Oh. <laughs> Nothing like... <laughs> Nothing like wrapping up the night with a little self-deliverance, amen? <laughs> Can my, um, my amazing ministry team come up here? If you need prayer tonight, and let's just be honest, some of us just need some prayer tonight. Please don't leave. Please come up here. Um, we want to love on you. We want to release some prophetic destiny and life over you. You are a new creation reality. God is doing something beautiful in and through you in this time. Yeah? Blessings. Love you guys.